Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would take that anointing that your Holy Spirit gives and uh, you would just double it on Aaron right now as he shares your word with us, that you just make him a vessel that you would speak through, Lord, and that we would be vessels that would hear. We would have ears to hear what your Holy Spirit wants to speak to each of us in this place on this day, Lord, that it doesn't matter the vessel to you, you use any of us, Lord. And I mean, you, you even used a donkey with uh, Balaam. And uh, Lord, I know if you, can, if you can speak, Lord, even through me, I'm very confident you can speak greatly through Aaron. So I just pray you anoint him now to teach us things from your word that you've laid on his heart that he could share today. And I do continue to look to you and ask that you'd heal me and heal anyone else who's suffering from this vog and from the cold flu thing going around our community right now. Lord, would you just give us your touch on our, on our islands here. Pour your breeze out on us, Lord, that it would blow the vog out to sea and not our way, Lord. Send it out down south. I ask it. If anyone agrees with me, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone that agrees said? Amen. 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 Take us into the word, brother. All right. Well, I'm hoping to outdo a donkey today since that was mentioned. As I've got a little, well, but uh, it is true. The Lord uses all of us uh, in different ways. And so um, we're going to be starting the book of James uh, this morning. And so... Um, as you guys are turning there, I wanted to share a little story that has to do with what we're going to be talking about today. When I, was, um, when I was a kid, I was a runner. I was pretty short and skinny, uh, one of the smallest kids around, and, uh, but I could run. I could run pretty good. In fact, when I was in middle school, I um, set the school record for the mile, 502. Uh, I'm sure that there's probably been some exchange students that have knocked that down about 30 seconds uh, nowadays. But, uh, but back in the day, that was, that, was a, that was pretty fast. And so uh, now, I'm com- now I get into high school, and I'm ready to start cross country. And it uh, was a longer distance than I'd done before. And it, I didn't actually, I kind of had a little bit of a rough start to uh, high school uh, within a day or two of, of starting high school, I got sick, and so I was like out for like a week. Um, I don't remember, probably had bronchitis because that was my thing. You know, everybody has their like typical illness, and bronchitis was mine. And, um, but I came back, the day I came back was race day, and I was all excited to run. So I actually called, called home and had my mom bring my running shoes, and uh, so I got, I was all set. We got on the bus. It was like an hour and a half or two hours, a long drive. The farthest we would drive on the bus to get to this place, Sutherland, Oregon. And, um, and it was time to race. And, uh, you know, I, we, we got started, and I, I didn't know quite how I was going to compete, but I kind of found myself in the middle of the pack and started running, and I was excited. And then uh, anybody, anybody, uh, runner, anybody a runner here? A past or present? Yeah, yeah. I'm not so much as anymore, but... Yeah, I, anybody ever had the thrill of, of, of running along and then you just start to lose? You got nothing in your tank. And, uh, and it, it's, it's really bad. Like physically, it's not good when you don't have energy to run, right? Because you need energy to run. And then on the, but it's even worse when psychologically you start slowing down and everybody starts passing you because now you're like mentally getting beat, right? And so... This is what happened to me, uh, and I, I just outkicked uh, the last guy in the race so that I could finish second to last. Uh, so things had changed a little bit from my perspective, and when I, so and I, I mean it was I was um, I was humiliated. Uh, I had kind of a reality check because always before I just running was so natural, and I had natural running ability. But what was the problem? I was I was just coming back from sickness. I didn't pace myself according to the shape that I was in, so that was a problem. And, um, and I hadn't done training. And, and so that left me 
you know, there was no wisdom in my approach to the race. I mean, it was, it was ignorance. I didn't have a lot of racing experience at that point. And so, um, you know, I, <laughs> it, was, it was the perfect storm of a, of a horrible race. Now, as the season went on, and I was training, and I was putting myself through some pain to get myself back in shape again, I got better. And by the end of the season, I shaved about a minute, of, a minute per mile off of this race. It was a three-mile race, um, 5K race. And so I had made progress. And we're going to talk about, you know, our spiritual walk is really a race. It's, it's, and it's kind of a long-distance race, too. And we're going to look in the book of James, and we're going to look at that, and we're going to see how, how that applies today. You, it takes endurance. This is not a sprint, if you hadn't noticed. This is, this is something that you got to, and you got to train for it, and you got to, you got to, you got to pay your dues. So let's look to the book of James. Now, well, the book of James was written by Jesus's half-brother, and um, he was, um, you know, you remember when Jesus was on the earth uh, before he died, did his brothers believe that he was the son of God? Yeah. Not at all. In fact, they mocked him, They're like, you know, you're, you're the son of God, you're the savior, Messiah, and all that, right? No, they didn't. Uh, isn't, it tr- isn't it funny how family always kind of puts you in your place? <laughs> well, they didn't actually put Jesus in his place rightfully because Jesus really was the Son of God, right? But how would you like to have Jesus as your brother anyway? It's like always the perfect one. I mean, <laughs> geez, that's got to really be hard. But what's amazing, and the, the other book that's written by one of Jesus' brothers is Jude. Now, they were half-brothers, right? Who is the mother? Mary. But for James and Jude, they were, their, their father was Joseph. Now, Joseph was, was Jesus' legal, legal father, but who was, the, who, was the, who was the biological father? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Right. So, so, and probably James was the oldest brother. Um, he's, he, lead, he leads the list of names of Jesus' brothers, so that's most likely he was the oldest. Uh, but still, you know, still got Jesus as your older brother. And, um, and so, and he, what I think is amazing is that these guys go from unbelieving before his death. After his resurrection, James is, gets to see his brother raised again. And now he's on fire for the Lord. And that is a big difference. And one of the, I think that's a, a great testimony about how, what evidence, if you want evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, you look at these changed lives. You look at how the, the disciples changed from before his death until after his resurrection. You look at his brothers, James and Jude, and how they changed from before his death till after his resurrection. These guys were willing to give their life up for the Lord after he's raised from the dead. So do you think they believed that he was raised from the dead? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now let's, um, let's look at, um, and James, by the way, uh, was the head of the Jerusalem Council. So as far as like the early church, he was one of the, one of the heads of the church. Uh, but I want you to notice as we start in James 1, um, how James refers to Jesus. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. Did he say my brother, my brother Jesus? No. He's talking to him as his bondservant. That he's a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, he's acknowledging Jesus is his Lord, and he's saying, I'm your bondservant. Uh, bondservants were, were, that was a voluntary position where you, you basically said, you know what, from now on, you're such a good master, I'm going to be a slave for you voluntarily. This is, this is how he describes himself. So he is, he is he, Jesus is his Lord and Savior, not his brother anymore. He's a spiritual, he's a spiritual leader. Now, Great for this. This is this is a, this next line, verse two, is something that I want you, and two and three and four. I want you to pay attention. This is a really important thing uh, to catch on to today. If you don't catch on to anything else, consider this. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now I don't know if it struck you the way it struck me, but I don't. This isn't something that I really latched on to as being a really good thing. You say it says to be joyful when you encounter various trials. Anybody find that that's not always very easy? 
I, I struggled, even as a Christian, I struggled with this, and I don't think I really even believed it, except that if you pay attention to what it says, that it's designed, when you go through trials, it produces endurance. Do we need endurance? Yeah. I, it's so easy, and back to the analogy of the running, and we can get knocked off course really easily. We get knocked down, and we, we kind of don't want to get back up again. And if you remember the parable of the, 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 the seeds that get sown, you know, some of those go through trials early on, and they, they don't make it. They get, the birds come and eat them. The, 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 the sun scorches them. They don't have roots. I mean, as believers... This is what happens. We get challenged, and um, if we don't know this, our faith is going to get rocked, and we're going to see that in just a minute. But I want, you, I want you to think about a couple of, a few examples in, in nature of this in action. Think about a pearl. Are pearls beautiful? Yeah, they're pretty nice, right? How do they get created? You got some irritation, some foreign object that comes in where it doesn't belong, and it starts causing problems. And in reaction to that, that's how a pearl is made. Take, take gold. How do you purify? Is gold pretty? Yeah. How do you make it more pure? You heat it up, you boil it, and then you scrape off all the impurities that come on there. Anybody feel like that might be you in life? You get boiled a little bit. You get scraped. But what happens? You get pure, you get pure gold. It's kind of exciting when you think about heaven being the streets are going to be paved with gold, so pure that you can see through it. Uh, that's been through a lot of boiling process probably too. Or maybe just God just made it that way to start with when it gets, comes to heaven. I think he can just pave with pure gold to start with. But for us, he's got he's to work on us. Um, diamonds, are diamonds pretty? Pretty nice. Makes a nice engagement ring, wedding ring. Um, we put a lot of value in diamonds. Diamonds come from compressed carbon, high pressure carbon over time. Nothing fancy about carbon, but pressure and time, that's what you get. So those are some examples. And in truth, some of the trials that we go through are self-inflicted, right? If I look at my life, some of the pain and suffering that I went through is stuff because I sinned. You know, I've broken relationships or, you know, did something stupid and get to pay the price for it. But is that always how pain and trials happen? Do you always deserve them? No. Uh, two great examples, Job. What did Job do to, to go through all the suffering where he lost his whole family and he's got sores and, every, and his friends, friends are telling him to curse God? Um, did he do anything to deserve that? No. Nope. Was it a test? Did he pass the test? Yeah, and he gave glory to God. God said, because remember, in that example, Satan said, he only loves you because he's got good things. He's got all of this stuff. God took all the stuff away and let him suffer, and guess what? He showed himself to be a true follower of God. He gave glory to God, even when everything else was bad. Um, and that's a great, well, how about Jesus? What did Jesus do to deserve suffering? Anything? Being perfect? not sinning. You could be jealous, but he didn't do anything wrong to deserve the suffering and the torture that he went through. And we're going to have to go through those things too. And God lets us go through trials so that we can grow and mature lacking nothing. And that is something that if you can let that sink into your brain and your heart and your soul, you're going to be armed and ready for the trials that you're going to face in this life. Um, anybody here not face trials yet? Because if you've been so lucky, and I'm guessing you haven't, but if you have, you'll realize that, well, then it's coming, right? There's suffering and trials are part of life. And, I, and, and now I get it. Like, for so long I didn't get it, but it was because I didn't want trials. Lord, just let me grow and be a good, a good servant without going through trials. But I'll tell you, and maybe you can agree to this too, the most spiritual growth I ever get is when I go through a trial. Why is that? Because for one, I've got to rely on the Lord, who is my strength anyway. But our pride gets in the way, right? We sometimes think that I don't really need the Lord. I'm okay. I got this. 
until you don't got this, and then you're in trouble, right? Oh, that's right. I need the Lord. And he's going to let us go through example, uh, he's going to let us go through trials and sufferings because we're going to need to go through that sometimes for us to grow and to be fruitful. You know, we're going to you know that sun's going to come out and we're going to deal with there's going to be weeds and there's going to be, you know, as we look back at that example of the 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 seeds that the Lord throws out, if we find ourselves in good soil, we can bear fruit, but we're still going to have the sun coming, we're still going to have weeds coming. We just but we can bear fruit when we go through those trials. Now, what happens when we don't, when we don't understand that? Let's, let's read on here. But any, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What wisdom are we talking about? It's the wisdom that we just talked about. It's the wisdom of knowing that when you go through trials, it's for your own good. It's so that you can, mature, you can be mature and you can complete. You're going to lack nothing in the Lord's plan for you to grow as a Christian and to walk with him. But he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And this is what happens when you don't understand that, if you don't know that, when your trial comes along, you get knocked off. And I, you probably know people um, that if this happened to. They start off on fire for the Lord. They're all excited about the Lord. And then what happens? They don't know this. So when they go through a trial and it doesn't go the way they wanted it to go, their faith gets rocked. And it can knock them completely out of faith at all. And it's without faith, you can't please God. The Bible says it's impossible to pre- please God without faith. That is your stretch out in faith to trust him. It's not that he's given you nothing to put your faith in, but you still have to, that step of faith is what matters, and it's what's going to get, so you don't want to be, you don't want to be tossed around like that, like the, like these words just described. I grew up in Oregon, and um, on the Oregon coast, there is driftwood all over the place, different sizes, and I mean, it's kind of cool, and you go, how did that get here? Well, just like somebody without faith, that, that wood came floating along and the waves pushed it all over and ended up wherever. And, um, and that's what happens to us if we don't grasp this solid, important thing that you got to know that God lets us go through trials so that we can be mature and we can grow in our faith. Um, all right, reading on. For the man who ought... N- for, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Again, just you just got to know, you, you've got to put your faith in the Lord, or you're going to get rocked and tossed, just, just like those waves, just like that driftwood. But the brother, oh, and I, you know, one thing I didn't mention that's really important, one of the things that I love about the book of James is that it's, it's, it's got a theme of, how to live Christianity in a practical way. That's the theme that you're going to see throughout this. So, um, so here he talks, is verse 9, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like the flowering gla- grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flowers fall, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Now, James is writing to the Jewish people, right? And the very par- part of it is talking about the 12 tribes. And this is probably one of the earliest writings of the New Testament. And at that point, mostly the new believers were Christian, right? Um, and so he's trying to encourage his brothers who are b- under persecution. Now, Jesus... Uh, and God doesn't, does he have anything against a rich man? No, no. I mean, Solomon was one of the richest people ever in the world, right? Certainly up to that time and maybe for all, for all time. Um, but the, what God looks at really is not whether we have money or not, but our attitude towards it. And remembering that the humble and the poor, uh, Jesus had a heart for them, right? And you remember the, the widow who came and she gave one coin? And remember Jesus' attitude about that? It's like, she's given out of her, that was all she had to live on, and she's willing to give that to the Lord. Now, 
She didn't have much, but what she did have, she was willing to give away. Did she have the right attitude about generosity? Yeah. And by the same token, you could be poor and be driven to have money and to possess and to, you know, your heart can be wicked towards the things of this earth. But if you, if you have wealth, but it doesn't control you, then you're not going to be like this. You're not going get, to get scorched by the sun. And when, you know, if you have things, by the way, can it be taken away? <laughs> I mean, the stock market, are you kidding me? It's like, I got a bunch today and tomorrow I got nothing, right? You can change that fast. Yeah, house in Pune, right? The volcano's going, right? Uh, there's my house. Oh, there it's not. It's gone. Um, and so things can change in an instant. Now, if you are grounded in the Lord and you realize that this is all temporary, everything that we have, you know, it, when, you, when your hearse is hauling you away, you don't have a, a U-Haul truck behind it, right? It all stays behind. What counts is what you do with your resources and not just your money and your, and your, and your wealth, but your time, what you do with your heart and your, and your, and your energies, right? That's what, that's what really matters. And so it's not wrong to have means, but what you want to do is make sure that, that your security is not in your stuff because your stuff may not, may not last for even all the time you're on this earth. All right. Now we come to another key verse. I want you to really listen to this. Verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. How happy are you who... Pers- who so this is the point. Why do you persevere? You persevere because God's got a crown of life. Now this is not saying that by your pursuits, by your good works, you're going to uh, get that crown of life. What it's saying is that if you really believe and put your faith and you make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, you will, you will walk with him. And in process, you will, he has good works for all of us to do. And Cookie's works are different than my works, right? But if I don't, but if I just go, yep, I'm a believer, and we're going to get this in just a minute, but if, if, you, if, you, if you think you're a believer and you walk out of here and you're not living it, I, I, I question whether that crown is really yours. And, um, you know, when, when um, I, I mentioned that I was a runner, right? So when I got to college, I had, um, uh, I had, I had figured out a few things. I trained. And let me tell you, man, I, I didn't go to a big college uh, it was a small college. I, was, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest where you got the University of Oregon, like these Olympic quality runners. That was not me. Um, my, my glory days of, 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 of winning races ended when I left high school. But now I, now I, was, a, a, I was a small fish in a, big, in a big ocean. But I look back, there was a, my, my first 10K race um, was, uh, was, I don't know, my junior year, I think, in, in college. And... Now, I just mentioned, right, the story about where did I finish in my first race in high school? Second to last. At least I wasn't last. Um, now I get to this 10K race, and there's probably 30 runners, and there were some University of Washington runners. I mean, I was, it was, a, I was, I was feeling a little uh, outclassed for sure. And we start the race. Now, anybody ever run a 10K on the race, or on, the, on a track? You come around, it's like 24 laps to go. What? <laughs> that's a little demoralizing. But so I'm, I'm running the race. Uh, a few laps into the race, I'm running second to last. <laughs> Familiar position, right? Um, and so I'm like, oh, man. And not only that, uh, as I'm running, my shin right here starts hurting. And I, I, it was kind of an unusual pain. I hadn't experienced that before. And I didn't think that it was going to let me finish the race. And I'm like, well, what the heck? I might as well just try to run my race, right? And, 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 and go as far as I can. Well, as I was going along, this time I had wisdom. This time I had training. And, and, when I, and I kept running my race. And pretty soon, guess what happened? These other guys are the ones that are starting to fade. And I'm starting to pass them. Now, I'd love to tell you that I, that I won the race. That would that, not even close. 
But what, what did happen was I finished the race, even though I had that trial in my leg going on. And it was the most perfect race I ever ran. My first, ra my first lap and my, sec my, my last lap were the fastest. And if you look at my, the, the fastest lap times to the, to the slowest, there was less than a second apart. It was like, bam, 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 bam. And that, that, if you're a runner, is hard to do. It's hard to duplicate your pace and keep it click, 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 just like, especially because what happens when you run along? You get more tired. You get more tired. You gotta, but I was able to finish the race. And I was, now, I didn't win the race, but for me, I ran the best race I ever ran. And spiritually, that's what we're supposed to do. I'm not competing against you, and you're not competing against me. And, and actually, cross-country racing uh, is actually a great analogy for our faith because can I save you, or can you save me? No. We're running our own race. But when you're on a cross-country team, the teammates matter. And there would be times where um, you're running, uh, you know, a cross-country race, and you're out and about, where, where you'll, like, come by somebody. Or maybe you'll pass them or vice versa. And you go, hey, man, you can do it. And you encourage your, your brother to run. Keep up the fight, man. Keep going. I'm going um, to re read a couple of things. Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, was somebody who... Uh, did he go through some adversity? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he was tortured a lot and left for dead and all. I mean, it's crazy what he went through. Um, now, in his case, he kind of deserved it, right? What did he do before he was saved? Persecuted. Persecuted Christians. Do you think God took offense at that? Yeah. In fact, you remember on the road to Damascus, what did he say? What did the Lord say to him? You've been persecuting me. And did he think he was persecuting God, by the way? No, no, he thought he was like, he was rallying for God without wisdom. He was doing it on his own understanding. And was he right? Nope, he was not right, but he got right. And when Jesus met him on that road, it changed his life. And he went on and he was able to persevere. And uh, let me read, um, this is uh, from 2 Timothy. This is Paul. Um, Encouraging Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store, in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award on that day. And not only to me, but to all of those who have longed for his appearing. Another uh, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 24 to 27, uh, Paul also says this, do, not, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run as, as, a, as to get the prize. Everyone who ke competes in the games goes into strict training to get a crown that will not last. Now, in the days, back in Paul's day, you would get a crown if you won, right? It would be a, but it wouldn't be a, any kind of crown like, like, a, like a king crown. It would be like a flower wreath that would, that would, that would, it would only last for so long. You'd, you'd get the glory for a little while and then that crown would, would fade. It wouldn't be good anymore. So he says, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run like a man ra running aimlessly. I do not fight like a, like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Anybody here an uh, Olympics fan? Yeah. So the last Summer Olympics, Mo Farrar was, was running in my race, the 10,000 meters. And at the start of the race, he got knocked down. But he got up and he kept running, and guess what? He got the gold medal. He wasn't going to let a knockdown, and let me tell you, if you haven't run before, if you get knocked down, it's a demoralizing, it's like, oh man, I'm just starting to run, and you've knocked me down. And a lot of falls happened at the start of the race. There was, uh, when, I was a, when I was running, there was uh, at, the, at the, um, the league championships, there was this like, 
it all started broad, and it pretty shortly, within like a, 100 meters, it was this narrow thing. So everybody was sprinting, and there's this muddy, muddy course, and, you're, and you got your cleats on because you wanted to get out fast and not get knocked down. Because when you get knocked down, it takes, it takes the wind out of your sails. You're just, just getting momentum, and now it's getting knocked out. Well, this guy went on to get the gold medal. And he had trained for that moment, and he wasn't going to get that, let that, that one setback affect whether or not he was going to win that race. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be on it for keeping after it and, doing, and, and, and not giving up and being encouraging to one another. Um, all right, let's keep going. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, as he himself cannot tempt anyone. Who tempts us? The devil. the devil. And our own lust, as we'll read in here in just a minute. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, w- has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and w- when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Classic example, King David, right? The man who slayed Goliath, it all started with a look. He's standing out at the palace looking out and he sees his hot babe taking a bath. Bathsheba. Coincidence? Not sure, but. So he sees Bathsheba. Now, was it wrong to see her? Was that a sin? No, that wasn't a sin. What happened after that was a sin because now he started, he goes from just a quick look and uh-oh, I better look away. I, don't, I shouldn't be looking at that. Now he like starts to lust after her. And you know the story. He pretty soon he calls her over, and uh, and they they sleep together. Now was she married? Yep. Yeah, that's not good, right? That's not good. Mm. This is not only a trial, but there's going to be pain and suffering that's going to go on it for both of them. So she gets pregnant. Oops, bigger problem. David tries to cover it. Did it work? Nope. nope. Just all he did was make his whole deeper and deeper and deeper. He's trying to dig himself out instead of confessing his sin to the Lord. And not only, and then at the end, of course, he kills Bathsheba's husband to cover his sin. And, you, and if you didn't catch it when you looked at the story before, does anybody else die? When they pull back, he sends them out to the front line and he pulls them back. But g- guess what? He's not alone. He's not fighting the battle by himself. And so other men who didn't deserve to die, and uh, did, did Bathsheba's husband deserve to die, by the way? No. no, what did he do? Had a wife? That's not wrong. No, but uh, so David had a lot of pain and suffering as a result of that. And one, it all started with a look, the temptation comes, right? But he didn't deal with the temptation. And innocently at the start, uh, pretty soon, he's filled with lust and bad, bad things happen. And I promise you, if you were to ask him today, was it worth it? I guarantee you would say, nope. Nope. But the devil's good at disguising things to look like it's all good. I'm sure that he had fun that one night, but he paid a price for the rest of his life. The rest of his life. We should take note of that and remember, don't give in to temptation. And remember, God, God doesn't tempt us. Remember, Jesus got tempted, right? Tempting is not a sin. And he's out in the wilderness and the devil is tempting him. Did he pass the test? Yeah. You know how he passed the test? One of the ways, he knew the word of God. And by knowing the word of God, he was armed. Now, Satan threw scripture at him, right? Yeah. Just out of context is all. You know, just missed the point. But he, but he used it to try to put a wedge between Jesus and the Father. And fortunately for us, it didn't work. But it's an example of, hey, we're all going to get tempted. We just don't want to give in to the devil. Don't give in to our flesh. And if you remember what you're, <laughs> you got to keep your eyes on the, on the finish line, right? That's, that's what we need to do. Um, I love the practicality of what James is saying here. This is good stuff. Do not be de- deceived, my brethren. Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, 
with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. We were just talking about the driftwood, right? <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't believe that God is using trials to help you, your faith gets rocked. But if you know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, now you can put your faith in that. And God doesn't change. His moral, his moral law has never changed. He doesn't go, well, if today it's cool to be whatever, right? We, we, got, we got to be politically correct. Well, guess what? We're supposed to know the truth and stick with the truth. And the truth is God doesn't change. And thankfully, he doesn't, right? His creation changes. We change. I'm getting more gray. You know, my body's aching a little bit more as time goes on. You know, the world around us is constantly changing. But God never changes. And he's had from the very beginning, the very, very beginning of man, Adam and Eve, he had a plan of salvation that has never changed. It came to, tr- it came to pass, but all as God had predicted it would. And we can... And when you've got a God who knows that kind of detail, can you trust him? We can put our whole life on him. That's what we do. And if we don't, and we don't know these truths of the Bible, our faith is going to get rocked. And I've had, I've had discussions before with people that I got humiliated. My, my inability to know this cost me, you know, I wasn't able to defend the gospel properly because I was ignorant. But you know what happened after that trial? After I failed, I studied that. I went back and I go, next time I come in across that, I'm going to be ready. I'm not going to get humiliated again. And that's why we need to keep, keep praying, keep reading every day. Read this book. What's in here will arm you and get you ready for the next trial that comes your way. And who knows, you might be ready and armed at that point so you, you can have a success story and not go, oh man, next time. I got to be ready next time. All right. Ah, this is a tough one. Oh, no, Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. Okay. Um, In the exercise of his will, he has brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Now, this is James writing in the first century church, right? This is the first generation of Christian believers. This is, Jesus is raised from the dead. Now the Messiah has has come now, and now we can raise. Now, what he's saying is, this is, it. this is talking about being born again. We have the word now, and he's like, we're the first fruits. We're the first generation of believers. And now, we've, and now we're born again. Now we can spread this word. We can spread the gospel uh, to the people around. All right. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Yeah. Uh, Anybody here struggle with anger? Um, I kind of come from a long, well, I don't know if it's a long line. I, I have some anger issues in my family. Let's just put it that way. Now, uh, I am adopted, so it's, not, the, it's not, not a hereditary thing. I think it's just a learned trait. Um, but I spent time when I was a kid around my grandfather, and let me tell you, he had a temper. He had kind of the Napoleon complex, kind of short guy with a big attitude, and nobody was going to wrong him, and I would kick him up in the air. And, um, and then, you know, my mom picked up some of that, and um, I could see, thankfully, I could see her trying to n- not be the same way. But it's hard. When you're around somebody, that that's how they, they vent. That's how they, they got that anger, right? Ang- we're not supposed to be angry. Now, Jesus, did he get angry? He did. Well, why, did, why was it okay for him to get angry? Righteousness, right? He was, he was angry because they were, they were taking the temple that was designed to bring people to God, and they were turning it into a business. Oh, hey, that, that lamb, that's not quite up to par, so we're going to switch this one out. You just pay a little difference here, and we're going we're gonna to market this and get you to, you know, we'll take a little off, of course, for shipping and handling, but then now it's right for the Lord. And then they'd take that one, and then they would, like, recycle it back around again, and it was a, it was a sham, and Jesus called them on it. That's righteousness. That's righteous anger. Now, we can be angry, and we can sin not, but my problem is I get angry, and then I want to sin. And, um, and I kind of have this pop-off valve. Now, fortunately, I don't take it out. I only use inanimate objects, but when I was a kid, I would hit a pillow, 
Like I would scream at the pillow and I'd hit the pillow and that would be like, that would be my pop off valve. Now that was a lot, that was hard to get, hard to hurt yourself when you do that. But when you kick something, you should make sure that there is not something solid in the box when you kick it. The reason why I say this is that one time when I got angry, and the other thing about anger, I don't know if you've experienced this too, family always seems to know where the angry button is. Anybody know that? You notice that? It's like they just know where that angry button I try to keep it hidden so nobody knows where it is, but it just keep, they keep finding it. And so um, I go, and I'm, oh, man, I was full of it. I was full of angry and so, I, uh, and so I kicked this box, and I played, um, I played soccer when I was really young, like middle school age, and then uh, I gave it up for running. But, so I had a pretty good soccer kick, but there was an 80-pound autoclave in this box that I didn't realize. And so it didn't have a lot of give. My foot had a lot of give. It took all of the brunt of the kick. So life lesson control your anger because you just may hurt yourself. Now that just hurt my foot, but we can hurt relationships. We can, we can, we can take brothers and sisters who are trying to follow the Lord and we can kick them right in the teeth right when they're trying to, to follow the Lord. And so we need to keep our anger in check. It can do a lot of damage. Um, for the anger... Uh, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Uh, here. But prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who deluded themselves. For any, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks his, at his natural face in the mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. So let me give you an example. You're sitting here today or you're listening to the message today. It gets done. You go out into your car in the parking lot and you drive away and you don't remember what we just talked about. You don't apply it. When we're talking about wisdom, what, what kind of wisdom? Wisdom is not just knowledge. Knowledge, pff, I can know what two plus two is. But if, if I don't know how to use it, it doesn't do me any good. We got to take the knowledge of what we read in this book and we have to apply it. And when we apply it, that's wisdom. If I walk out there and I leave here and I'm unchanged and it doesn't affect how I live and nobody can tell any difference about, I, in other words, if I'm not, I'm not lining up with my Christian faith, then I'm not a doer of the word. I'm just a hearer of the word. Action speaks louder than words, Right? And uh, how many people think they're saved, think they know because they know, oh, I believe in God. But you couldn't tell it by looking at them. And remembering, we don't, our walk is not, doesn't, doesn't, we're not saved by our walk, right? We're only saved by one thing. What's that? We got to follow Jesus. But what did Jesus do? He said, deny yourself, pick up your cross. What does the cross mean? It means suffering right? Jesus suffered a lot. And I always, I remember as a kid, I always knew about like being nailed to a cross and, you know, how humiliating and, and how much suffering. You know what? I think he was just as brutal, if not more brutal, what happened before he got to the cross. When you look at, you know, scourging and wh whipping and all, it didn't really, until I really studied it more, I didn't realize how brutal it was. His body was busted up before he ever made it to the cross. And he did all that for you and for me. But he didn't do it so that we would just go about our own business doing our own thing. Because we're either a slave to sin or we're a slave to righteousness. If we're a slave to righteousness now, hey, guess what? We're letting Jesus actually be our Lord. It's so easy today to let the world derail us. We Do what, do what you want to do. Do what feels good, right? That's a, it's all about us. And Jesus was, his example is just the opposite. It doesn't really fly in the self-absorbed world that we live in. But guess what? We're not supposed to blend in. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to be a light in a dark world. That's what we get to do. Um, 
But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Law of liberty. What's the law of liberty? Well, I just mentioned, right? We're either, we're a slave to something, right? If you're, if you're controlled by the lust and the, of the flesh, if basically what you, wh- whatever you desire is what you're, you're trying to do, you're a, sl- you're a slave to sin. But Jesus made it pretty easy, actually. When he was, when, uh, when he was asked, what are the two greatest commandments? That's, you'll note his answer was really good because it sums up. He, in fact, he said, the two greatest commandments are what? That's right. Love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said, if you do that, you'll fulfill the law. You've got it covered. Is that not freeing? Yeah. Isn't that freeing? I mean, come on. We, we don't, if all I, you mean all I got to do is just, I got to go around in love? If I go around in love, then I'm going to fulfill the law? Which, we're not saved by the law, but it's got good stuff in there. It's a lot easier to help your neighbor if you're not murdering them or stealing from them, right? Encourage your faith. So that's what we need to be doing. We need to be doers of the. Uh, we need to be doers of this. And Jesus made it so simple. It's we're, it's so freeing when you realize not only did God save us, but He loves us not to leave us where we're at. And all we need to do now is two things: love God and love your neighbor. I want to end with uh, with this. This is Hebrews chapter twelve. On this theme of, on this theme of, long distance running, and what we need to do, to hang in there when there's trials, and to let us be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, We thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of James, Lord, and its practical application to our life, Lord. And I pray now that for each of us, we will just let it sink in that when you let us go through trials, Lord, it's so that you can perfect us. Lord, you can boil us and you can pressure us and you can do all these things, Lord, that get rid of the, the bad, Lord, and help to purify us, Lord, so that we can put our eyes on Jesus, the finisher and perfecter of our faith. We pray now, Lord, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word, Lord, loving you and loving our fellow brothers. We ask this now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Well, guys, that may... Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, amazinggracekona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's amazinggracekona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.